it's not school. We hire adults and we want them to feel empowered. You know, our employees, it's no longer the employer driving the experience. It's the employee. The employee is driving their experience. They're telling us what they want. And we have to take that data. We have to do something with it. And people don't want to be held in this little box. They don't live that way at home. So why would we do that in the work environment? Hi, HR Nation. Welcome back to another episode of the HR Leaders Podcast, the show where we explore the future of work with industry experts and HR executives from the world's leading global brands. On today's show, we're joined by Kate Grimaldi, who's the Senior Director of Enterprise Talent Strategy at Paylocity. Welcome to the show. How are you? Thanks. I'm really good, Chris. Thanks for having me. I was just admiring all of your paintings in the background there. I see that you're, pro- you're, you're, progressing, oh. you're progressing your skills now. Yes, I'm working on it. You know, lots of art classes. Um, I'm hopefully going to be able to draw a unicorn freehand very soon. Yeah. Uh, as parents, we understand that you gave me some good advice now. Just take loads of photos, capture it all in a folder as well, or you end up with walls all over the house full of artwork um, as well. It's up to her. It'd be wallpapered all over the place. <laughs> yeah. My, my, my little one's now obsessed with just stickers, and I just find stickers everywhere. Everywhere. Mm-hmm. All over the places, places I don't even realize. Um, I actually went to dinner with a client recently and Robin spent a, the first half an hour of the dinner just sticking stickers on, on our client. Um, oh. he, he was a great sport about it. He's got kids, so he understands. But he just left full of stickers <laughs> all over. I was like, welcome to London. <laughs> so, and don't wash those clothes without taking those stickers off. The amount of clothes that I pull out of the dryer with like sticker, like <laughs> sticker backing on it. I'm just like, oh, there's another shirt room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, how you been? First and foremost. Busy. Good. I I feel like, I feel like things are still just really different, you know, really in shuffling and trying to figure out where we, where we plant our feet Um, as HR leaders. I feel like we're, we're really responsible for a lot of people. I've, my daughter asked me yesterday what my job was. And I, I said, what do you think my job is? She's like to take care of me. And I said, yes, what's my other job? She said, I don't know. And I told her and she said, what does that mean? What do you do? And I said, well, most days I feel like I take care of a lot of people and help other people take care of themselves. And, you know, nothing like healthcare, but definitely in the corporate world, trying to keep everything together. It's a lot. I mean, it's super fun, but, um, you know, I think a lot of the HR leaders out there probably can empathize with the fact that, you know, you're responsible for a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. Whilst trying to take care of yourself. Yes, if you remember to do that, that's for sure. <laughs> if you remember to do that, yeah. yeah. Tell everyone a bit more about your role and responsibilities because you cover quite a few areas. For sure. Yeah, so my role is a little bit different. You know, traditionally, when you think about talent strategy, most people think about uh, recruitment, attraction. Um, you know, my role is kind of a mix of a couple of things. So I've got internal communications, I've got organizational development, um, the talent strategy piece, employer brand, and then really our thought leadership you know, piece for us. And really what all of that is, is, you know, once we attract and we get them here, how do we keep our employees? How do we make sure that they're engaged? How do we make sure they're getting the development that they need? What's our strategy as a company to internally promote people, move them through, figure out, you know, where they go? How does that work with our comp strategy? And then how are we giving them professional development along the way? Um, We really believe that it's not just about, you know, your career, but at some point you're probably going to go somewhere else. Obviously we'd love for you to stay forever, but gone are the days where people stay at the same job for 30 years. So how do we make sure that when you leave, you feel like it's a company that you'd recommend and that you feel confident in telling someone else, Hey, go work there. You're going to get a lot out of it. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that that's now not an afterthought and that, yeah. and it's okay to have that conversation and no, cause it is going to happen. Yeah, (laughs) it it is. And if you're having, you know, stay interviews and you're talking to people about what they want and you give them that space, that psychological safety and and you're vulnerable with them to say, hey, understand this might not be for you forever. The amount of people I have had who leave and still refer people to me to work for me is mind boggling. And I think it's really just because we care about the whole person and we understand that your life is different and not every part of your life is going to fit every part of your job all the time. Yeah. But also at the same time, it is a retention tool because they're more Uh, likely to tell you when they're frustrated to ask questions, to come forward. Right. And a lot of times there are solutions. Maybe it could be another role that they move, move laterally in the organization. Maybe it's an issue that they just had with their benefits or leave, you know, whatever it may be. But if you create that 
that you know that psychological safety and and people understand how to do it. Then most people I know that leave organizations didn't even tell their leaders why, like really, really why until it's too late. If that makes sense. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, creating that safety and giving people the opportunity to tell you what's really on their minds also lets them know that they're being heard. And a big part of what we see when people leave is they don't tell their leaders because they don't feel like they're going to be heard. Most people don't even aren't looking for even a specific solution. They want to know that you care about what they have to say and yeah. that you're going to think about it the next time you make a decision. And so having those really honest conversations I have found with people to say, hey, this might not be for you forever. What do you need right now? It really opens the door, to, as you said, kind of for the future to for them to be honest. Yeah. What are some of the, sort of the, the tactical ways that you've been able to achieve that going from looking at specifically just work performances, which is, you know, we traditionally to the entire person. I think we all agree that that's a good approach, but how do you action that? and filter that out through the organization? Yeah, I'd love to say it's super easy and I have a um, one-stop shop, but what I will say the thing that is a great place to start is with stay interviews. So I talk to people on a regular basis and a lot of my questions start with what keeps you here and what makes you think about looking for something different? And now granted that has to happen after you have some sort of psychological safety, but really having that conversation where you ask questions like, what can we as a company do to make you feel more engaged? Has there been something in the past that you wish we would have done differently that would make you feel differently about how we're doing? And so it's not even any sort of specific set of questions. It's giving someone the freedom to say, what keeps you here? Why do you stay? Um, the amount of people that are surprised when I ask them that question and they kind of stop. They're like, well, do you really want to know? I said, yeah, of course I want to know. And then I also want to know, like when you were on LinkedIn looking at a new job, what made you look for that new job? And I'm okay with it. And so I think just opening that up, creating that safety. I think the other thing is as an organization, you have to acknowledge that work is different. What people want is different. It's not the same as it was before and it will never go back to normal. And this constant sort of, oh, we're getting there, we're getting back to normal. It's not gonna happen. People are going to continue to want something different than they've ever wanted before. And the things that they want more than ever are knowing that, you know, they can integrate their personal life, that they're not spending all day and night at work and then being told, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't get that promotion. You know, a big part of it is also helping people see the connections. This project gives you this skill. This skill is going to lead you to this next opportunity. People want to know their path. So being able to create the psychological safety, have the conversations regularly and help them see, you know, what their path is allows you to also really show them that not only is their voice being heard, um, but that you have a plan, you have a strategy. And it's very clear when companies don't have a strategy of how they keep their people. Mm -hmm. And so really at the highest levels of your organization, making sure everybody agrees on what that strategy is. Are we okay with really high turnover or do we wanna keep every single person? There are some orgs where people say, yeah, I'm okay with high turnover. I want the best people, I want them for a short amount of time and I'm okay if they leave. You just have to know what that strategy is. You have to be honest about it. Yeah. Uh, are these owned by you? Uh, are you having these interviews or are you, are you or are the, or are the managers having them directly with the teams? Yeah, both. So our HR team handles a lot of them, but we've really equipped our managers to also have those conversations and make sure that they're a part of their regular touch bases, their one-on-ones. And again, you know, I always tell people, it doesn't have to be, okay, every three weeks on the dot, you're asking someone, Hey, Chris, do you still want to work here? Yeah, like that? That's a good point. How often, like, what would you yeah. recommend to people listening? Uh, I usually encourage people to do it quarterly. I say, stick a note on your calendar and, you know, at one of your next one-on-ones over the next 90 days, tell and be honest with the person. Hey, I'm going to ask you a couple questions during our one-on-one -on -one today that are going to feel a little strange, but I just want to talk to you a little bit more about why you like working here. And I want to see if there's anything that you can give me that'll help me kind of set my strategies going forward or that I can provide feedback to any of our other leaders to figure out how we make things better. Um, having a culture that has open and honest feedback only works if you have to actually ask people what their feedback is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. And then do you communicate more broadly about how you're going to, what you're going to do? Because I think sometimes we have these, you know, stay interviews and surveys stuff like that and, we, and then, th then the employees don't see anything. <laughs> like, yeah. Great. I gave all of this feedback and nothing was done about it. 
<laughs> yeah, so that's one of the perks I love about my job. So I'm responsible for all of our internal communications. So re, we run a biweekly executive Q&A where we survey our teams. We ask them what they want to know about. And then we actually answer the questions and we answer them live um, every other Friday morning. And they're tough questions. They're not easy softball questions. Um, they're tough. They talk about inflation. They talk about the economy. They talk about, you know, social issues. And our teams are answering them. And everything we don't get to goes in a PDF um, or an FAQ, you know, the following Monday so people can get to it. Um, but we do. We follow up. And I would say that's one of the things I love about my job the most because when I tell people, hey, it's important to have a conversation and follow up, I'm doing that. So I'm making sure that the surveys that we're doing, that I'm able to get them answers and follow up. And there's been times where we answer questions and we say, hey, we're going to we're gonna answer this question. We don't have a good answer. We don't. We have no way. We, as this leadership team, can't fix whatever X issue is going on in the world. We empathize and we're here for you, you know, as a team, but we can't fix it. And our teams respond really well when we're just honest about what we're working on and why we can do something about it and why we can't. Yeah. It's super powerful, isn't it? Like we, most companies just avoid those conversations, but by not addressing it, it actually makes it 10 times worse. You have the uncertainty, you have the gossip, you have all the other things that come along with it, as opposed to we hear you, we understand, we, you know, we, we, we empathize with you. We don't know what we, we don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to try and figure it out. Right. Or just saying yeah. you don't know. Right. And that's so refreshing. So refreshing. <laughs> to hear that and say oh, okay oh and, and also in many cases oh it's not just me that's struggling as well it's also these leaders everyone's in this together we're going to figure it out um yeah. as well yeah what about um we've seen a massive you know transformation of hr over the last couple of years especially how have you seen that impact the role of your role and the role of the hr moving from more I don't want to say policy, police, and administration, but <laughs> I suppose that's the way to say it, two more strategic, yeah. strategic partners of the business. No, I think you're completely right. You know, the best way that I can explain that is HR has really moved into this connection role. So our job is really the connector. How do we help business leaders figure out and partner with either the right outside partners or the right internal partners to move their strategies forward? How do we help employees get what they need? And how do we make sure that we are equipping them and having sort of a self-service approach? You know, um, people want help and they want assistance, but they also want to be independent and they want to be able to take care of things on their own. And so, you know, HR has really kind of moved into this sort of connector strategy role, which is how do I help you connect with the right people and the right things that you need to get your strategy going and to be successful? I would also say too that, you know, HR is always going to have an administrative component, right? We're always going to need policy. You're always going to need process. And that's just part of who we are. I think owning that and being honest about it is key. And that's kind of where things have changed is where, you know, the role of HR has been to say, yeah, a part of our job is to write that policy because you have to have that policy. You know, you just have to. But the other part of our job is to help figure out how we make that policy better. And so I think instead of just writing and enforcing, we've now taken to the, hey, what do you actually think of that policy? How do we change it? How can we make it better? What would you like to see differently? What have you seen in other companies that you've really liked that you think we should adopt here? So the policy police becomes more of that connector and that strategic piece around how we actually use those things to better the environment for the employee. Yeah, and it's, and it's more of a move towards principles than policies. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so these are our guiding principles. And then you kind of give your leaders the freedom within that framework to work with their teams to decide how and when they work and how work yeah. gets done, right? As in the past, it was like, you had to do this. Yeah. <laughs> and these, even though it made no sense, you're kind of punishing the wider, uh, you know, employee population for the few that may Absolutely. And it's tiring. I, I do not want to hold people accountable to something that is pointless. I, we have, we hire, we've been hiring so many people and I've had so many new people recently tell me there's no policy for this. There's no policy for that. And I said, I know. They're like, oh, are we going to write a policy? I said, no, we trust you to make a good decision. I'm like, well, how do I know exactly how many dollars I can spend on my meal? I'm like you don't. I said, make a good decision. Think about your, you know, think about that as if you were going out to dinner for yourself like, what would you do on a random Wednesday night if you had to have dinner? And it works because if you trust people until they give you a reason not to, you don't need those really specific hard and fast things. You can create processes. Hey, if you have a question, here's the process how to get that answer. If you want to know where to book this, here's the process to do that. 
but it's not school. We hire adults and we want them to feel empowered. You know, our employees, it's no longer the employer driving the experience. It's the employee. The employee is driving their experience. They're telling us what they want. And we have to take that data. We have to do something with it. And people don't want to be held in this little box. They don't live that way at home. So why would we do that in the work environment? How's how's it made, we've all seen this dramatic process shift or this, you know, people talking about the future of work we're in we're in it (laughs) we're in it right now um how's it made how's it make you feel seeing how far we've come yeah in some sense i'm i'm proud and in other sense it feels like it's disappointing that it took something so large to affect the entire world for so many people to wake up and say oh this is actually possible Um, so I'm proud that people are owning it and that they're opening their arms saying, let's think differently. Let's figure out how we really allow people to integrate their lives and their work and help them see that what they're doing at home is just as important, what they're doing at work. But yeah, I wish it would have come sooner. I wish I, in some respects, I wish I would have woken up sooner to see it. Um, you know, we have to be our own sort of influencers of change and I'm glad it's happening. I just wish it would have happened sooner. And I think we're going to see even bigger changes in the next 18 to 24 months. I just, I have this feeling that people, people are gonna feel more empowered to really speak up for what they need and want. And there's gonna be more people, myself included, who are willing to say, yeah, you know what, let's try that. I mean, think about how far we've come in the last couple of years, we can try that. What's the worst that's gonna happen? And I think, I think work's gonna look really different um, in the next 10 years, for sure. Yeah. When you imagine sort of your daughter older, what, and and what, I mean, my four-year-old daughter older, what, what do you hope that work looks like then? Can you imagine they're gonna be like, what, you used to go to an office every day? I know. That's crazy, <laughs> mom. I know, I think about that. Nine to five? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, what do I hope? You know, I hope work, I hope work is something that she's passionate about. And I hope it's something that she enjoys doing. I don't know that we're ever gonna get away from spending a good part of our life at work, um, unless you don't need to work. So I hope that work is different where she can feel like she can bring her whole self to work, her quirkiness, the things that make her unique and that they're welcome and that she's not sitting there having a conversation with someone saying, I don't feel like I'm included. Um, And I hope it's a job that she likes and it makes some sort of a difference, even if it's just a difference in a small part of the universe. Um, yeah. But it, it makes a difference and, and she's proud to do it. Um, I, I think I've talked to a lot of people now who they're at that point in that crossroads. They're trying to figure out what's next because they're not proud to do what they're doing anymore. They don't feel passionate about it. Um, they're not connected to it. And so, and it doesn't mean they have to go change the world, but they want to do something where they feel like they're making a difference. Yeah. Well, that last part is very important, right? And um, that's something I constantly struggle with because I speak to all my friends, family members, and I would say probably... 90 plus percent of them do not like their job and don't get any fulfillment in it and they do it because they have to and because they need to pay the bills and because and even when I meet new people it's constantly the same thing like the idea that you can work in the job that you really enjoy and that you feel like you're you have a sense of purpose and you're making a difference is so rare maybe it's just my friendship circle but Friends of friends mm-hmm. of friends that I speak to, most of the majority of them are in a job because, you know, they've got maybe golden handcuffs, they've got the mortgage, they've got the childcare, they've got the thing. They're like, well, I, I just have to do this. And they don't see another way. So I do hope that we have a future where everyone can wake up in the morning and be super excited to get out of bed, turn up for a job where they feel fulfilled. And there's that sense wow. of purpose. That definitely seems, and that probably sounds like a fantasy, right? What you just said to most people, they're probably thinking that's never going to happen. Yeah. Maybe it's not every day, but I do believe there'll be a world where majority of the time people are like, yeah, you know, I like doing this. This is, this. I like people I work with. I like the job that I do. I think we can get to that point, especially if we continue to let our employees drive, you know, what they want their experience to be. Yeah. Absolutely. And we're seeing that, right? As you said, that's one of the biggest game changers. And we call, you can call it the great resignation, the great reimagination, the great, I've heard of a million of them at the moment. They're, run, they're running out of ideas um, <laughs> of what they're going on now. But people, people had a lot of time to think. And they're like, yeah. do, do I really want to be doing this? And I, I, I have a friend who recently took like a 30% pay, pay cut to go, to go work at another business because they gave him that flexibility because he wanted to be around his kids and his family and 
have a different lifestyle. And he's like, well, I'll take that 30% pay cut because this is, this means more to me. Yeah. You never really and hear about that in the beforehand, people doing that. And I see so many people just taking a break, just saying, you know what? Or that, I'm yeah, just, you're right. Yeah. I'm just going to take, I'm going to take a few and, and they're honest about it. Hey, I don't have anywhere to go. Nothing terrible happened. I just need a break. I just need to do something different and I need to be someone different. I think that, I don't know. I mean, I think we got to wake up. That is, that's a big thing when you see, I mean, I've seen really strong HR leaders who have been in the field, you know, for 25 years, who've had huge jobs and they've done great things and they're raising their hand saying, I'm just going to take a break. We have to wake up. There's some, there's something going on there. I mean, if that many people need a break, so I think we still have a long way to go, but I think we're headed in the right direction. A hundred percent. Let's not make this too negative for everyone. (laughs) Everyone is like, no, no, there's definitely a lot of uh, silver linings that come out of it. And we spoke to many, many of those. What about, how have you seen this um, transformation um, differentiate or develop your coaching strategy? and how you develop and lead and develop leaders, the leaders of tomorrow. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I really noticed is we kind of talked about earlier is about that honesty and, you know, sort of that transparent feedback, what that has really changed is, you know, I think coaching before specifically when we were thinking about how we develop people, it was solely about skills for the job. And we would say things like they don't exhibit these three skills. So they're not ready for the next role. And what has really changed is it's not so much about job skills there. You can teach someone to do a lot of different job skills. It's about those leadership skills that you have to help them hone and help them figure out how do they be a better leader? How do they have those honest conversations? How do they show up with great communication skills, um, confidence? You know, that's not something that we, you know, I think about at least when I was in school, nobody talked about confidence. Nobody taught you how to speak with confidence. I mean, you might've had a speaking class, but it was more about the content, not the way you delivered it. And, you know, I think the way that we've really changed some of our coaching strategies is more about sort of that professional development is how do we just get you ready for the next level professionally, wherever that is. And it's agnostic of the company. Yes, there are job skills and there are different things we do to help you get those skills. Um, But making sure that the competencies that you need as a professional are being met more so than just kind of putting you in this box and getting you ready to be a manager of this specific team. No, definitely. And also, you, you, if you look at the core competencies that we would list out even just a few years ago, things like leading with empathy uh, wouldn't even be in there. <laughs> no. Wouldn't even make the top 10 um, no. uh, as well now, right? So also that those ex- ex- expectations are completely changed. But along with that, how managers and leaders are rewarded and compensated also need to change to reflect I- those behaviours. Absolutely. And you also have to teach people how to be resilient. You know, those core competencies, exactly. it was never about resilience. It was never about taking care of yourself. You you said to me earlier, <laughs> you're like taking care of yourself. And I said, oh, if you remember, um, but that's really what it is. I mean, if you're not coaching a leader on how to take care of themselves, they're never going to be a good leader to their team. And those are things that we never talked about five years ago. We didn't talk about being resilient in the face of you know, X, Y, and Z. We never talked about being vulnerable, creating psychological safety. You know, I wouldn't consider myself a super touchy feely person, but I think those things are super important and I can be empathetic. Um, and I am very empathetic to what other people are going through. So I think that's just, and maybe what, maybe kind of back to your original question is how have those coaching strategies changed? Our core competencies have changed. What we need people to exhibit is different than what it was before. And so we've changed our strategies to help them do that. And it does align more with, you know, how to be a good leader, how to be a strong contributor to your company in the role that you're in, not necessarily just how do you climb the ladder and get to the next role. Yeah, that was like our only focus. <laughs> it's like, what do I do and need to say or act to do in order to get up there? Um, yeah. as well where it's actually changed dramatically especially now where companies are looking at their leaders as more um, talent incubators to have you know you're almost rewarding talent leaving your function and going to other parts of the organization as opposed to being talent hoarders so that's also yeah. a massive shift <laughs> in yeah. mentality when you move from you know this traditional hierarchy to project-based work and now you're actually encouraged and rewarded to have leaders, uh, people within your team develop and grow throughout the organization. 
Okay. We're testing a framework about that right now in our sales organization where we are encouraging people, managers to get their teams promoted into other roles and mm-hmm. giving them incentives to do that. Hey, if someone on your team gets promoted, maybe you get a, you know, maybe you get a break in your quota, maybe you get an additional part of your bonus because we want them to see that it's really important to help people develop. Don't, don't cage them, right? They're a bird. They want to fly, let them fly. And we'll reward you for that because that only helps us because then when that person has a great experience and they feel like they were encouraged to do more, they're going to go tell their friend. And now You've walked into attraction, retention, inclusion, development, all the things you want to put off your list. Yeah. It's a big change though, right? Because psychologically, culturally, systems, because, you know, sales is a great example because I remember my team where I had one of my top salesperson, um, they wanted to promote them into being a manager. I was like, wait a minute, that you're now taking 20,000 pounds of, uh, of purse of commission that I was getting off of override commission off that individual. So you've literally yeah. just taken 20 and there was no thought of that. They were like, no, it's fine. Cause we've got this role. I'm like, no acknowledgement of the fact that that happened. Then you can imagine how the motivator <laughs> was yeah. that I spent two years developing this individual to be just to lose 20 K a year on my salary. <laughs> Yeah, as and well. now be rewarded for what you did. You de- helped develop that person. That person's going to get rewarded with the next role. So they're going to make more money. What do you get rewarded with? Losing money? That yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Yeah, but that's still normal. I'm even friends with them now. Yeah. So there's a lot of work. <laughs> there's a lot I'm of work sorry. that needs to ha- be happen, um, ha- happen as well. Because later on, I was really proud of it. You know, I, once I got over that and, and I was really... And uh, one of the things I'm really passionate about is developing people and seeing them grow and develop. And I get a lot of satisfaction from that. Forget yeah. About, forget about money um, as well. But obviously at the time, <laughs> like, this is not a great move. I had a bad day um, as well. Listen, before I let you go, I want to jump into our quick fire round, yep. which I do with everyone. I'm going to ask you some questions, but you only have 30 seconds for each question. Are you ready? Oh, I guess. I hope. <laughs> um, what are your hobbies and passions outside of the office? Oh, I love to read. Um, and then I love to explore with my daughter. We just moved to a new area. And so we are, we went out last night and we did a girl's night and we just explored, tried new places, went to new places, did new things. And yeah. And then a good book. I love great book recommendations. I'm always reading. Yeah. When do you get the silence to read a book with a daughter, a five-year-old daughter? Oh, I mean, late at night. Yeah, late at night. <laughs> super late at night a glass sure. a glass of wine in the book and then you're, just, yeah. you're set and then i fall asleep after five pages but yes you know it's still good sounds like my wife i normally come in the living room i'm like wake up bedtime come on get off the sofa <laughs> she's just asleep there with the book and the wine yeah. <laughs> so, okay <laughs> sounds familiar okay yeah. um if you could I mean, we might have covered this but if you could click your fingers and change one thing about hr what would you change the stigma I would change the stigma. People think that um, HR only cares about the company and only cares about the policy. And most people get into HR because they care about the people. And um, that's hard to get around. It's a hard stigma to get around. But yeah, I would change that. Needs a rebrand, right? Yeah, huge rebrand. (laughs) Needs a rebrand. How would your family and friends describe what you do for a living? (laughs) I don't know that they could. Um, I think my daughter said it best last night. She said, you, you take care of me and you take care of other people. And I said, yeah, you know, I do. At least that's my goal anyway, is to, you know, help people. I think, I think my, I think my family would say, I think my family would say, I'm trying to find ways to keep people happy at work. I think that's what they would say. That's nice. It's better than, better than them saying you fire people. Brilliant. Yes, that's true. I have had that. The higher and fire girl. Yeah, people love that. They yeah, like to say that. I can imagine. Cool. I can imagine. Um, what's one thing that HR leaders don't talk about enough, but they should? Oh, gosh. Just one thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, I think there's two things. Um, so I'm going to give you two. One of them is they don't talk about um, just taking care of themselves enough and what they want out of their career. You know, HR is a servant, it's a servant leadership type of role. So your goal is to connect and work for the employees and work for the leaders. And a lot of times we don't talk about how that affects us personally and what's going on with us and how that affects what we're trying to do. We're trying to juggle and keep everyone happy. And we don't talk about that for ourselves. And then I don't think we talk about how hard it is sometimes to 
be taken seriously from a strategic perspective. Like we have an objective point of view. And if you give us the opportunity, we'll not only give you that objective point of view, but we will help you get there. Like that is our goal is to make you successful. So I think talking more about taking care of ourselves and then, you know, how we really become sort of that strategic partner and not saying we don't have it, but just, we don't talk about it enough as a group to say like, how are you getting across to your leaders? How are you really doing that influencing? Mm -hmm. No, I love, love that answer, by the way. Um, if you wasn't doing this role and you wasn't working in HR, what would you be doing? Oh, that's easy, Chris. I'd be sitting on a beach with a book and a margarita. <laughs> I'm in a job. <laughs> but I love that as, oh, a, as a very honest go-to there. What other career do you think you would have landed in? Um... Oh, probably some sort of a, um, probably nonprofit, some sort of like social work yeah. or um, community mental health, you know, just really helping people live their best life. No, nah, love it. Love it. Um, have you ever considered quitting? Yeah, every day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not every day. That's probably a little dramatic. But yeah, I've considered it a lot. I can't imagine that there are people out there who haven't. Um the last couple of years have been tough. I, you know, it's been tough for a lot of people. And I would say there was a long time there where I was at home with my family, trying to take care of my family and also trying to take care of thousands of employees. And yeah, that's tough. It's really tough, but yeah, I have, I mean, I don't know what else I would go do, but yeah, I, I definitely considered it. I've also considered just taking a break and trying to figure out what that means. Um, so we'll see. I don't know. Yeah. But yes. No, I appreciate your honesty. And uh, it's the same reaction I get behind closed doors. And one of the reasons I always ask, uh, um, ask you that question is because no one really talks about that. You mentioned it earlier. You literally mentioned it a few minutes earlier about how tough it is. And no one really talks about it. So I do think it's important that we do talk about it. Um, so people also understand that, oh, it's not just me. That this, no. bit, this feeling this way. And it's also okay, especially given the last few years. Yeah. Um, we do well. a great job at checking on our leaders and our employees. We do a terrible job of checking on each other. Yeah, definitely. Um, who would you say is someone in your career that's had a big impact on you in your career? Um, yeah, I worked for someone, um, gosh, a lot of people, but I would say I, I worked for someone years and years ago. Um, and I don't know if she'll see this, her name's Lena. And um, I loved working for her because she told me something really important one day. I was so frustrated with who I was working with. And I said, I'm not being developed. I'm not learning anything. Like, this is this is pointless. I don't, and I just, and she very calmly just said, she goes, you're learning a ton. I said, I'm learning nothing. That's the problem. She said, you're learning all the things that you will never do as a leader. And you are learning all the things that you don't like and how someone is being led or how someone's taking care of your team. So she said, in actuality, this is probably the best opportunity for you because you can start keeping track of all the things you never want to do. I have taken that with me and I've kept that to my core forever. And anytime I'm frustrated and I feel like I'm not getting what I want out of something, I just remember her telling me, yeah, but think about all the things you're learning. We look at learning as being only positive and only great things. We never really talk about how you can learn things that you don't want to do and how you can avoid those obstacles. So she was super influential um, for me. And then um, I also spent a lot of time, you know, just kind of following different um, different people. And we had uh, uh, we have a podcast and we had uh, Johnny C. Taylor who runs Sherm on, and I thought he had some really great things. So I love kind of seeing what he's doing and what he's up to too. Love it. And then last question, what advice would you give to the HR leaders of tomorrow? Take care of yourself. Take time. You know what? At the end of the day, you're not in healthcare. You're not saving lives. And so you have the ability to put your arm up and say, hey, I need a break. And a break is not an hour to go get lunch. A break is not a day off to go run errands. Take a break. Take some time for yourself and you know, check on, check on your friends and ask other people how they're dealing with it. We all keep it inside. And then we never actually share the things that we're dealing with to kind of help make things better. So I would say, just reach out to your HR friends. I'm sure that they have things that, you know, that will help you and be open to it. And gosh, just take time for yourself. Just, just do it. Nobody, you're not going to get fired for taking a break. You're just not. Mm -hmm. So yeah, <laughs> love that. Well, look, thank you so much. 
for taking the time to join. I appreciate you. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing your journey and experience. And I wish you all the best until we next week. I thank you so much for having me, Chris. This was so much fun. And I love that we could uh, share a little bit about our current artwork issues. So I hope <laughs> to start that. Well, we'll do. Start an album of artwork. Should we do a show and tell next time? So I'll like I'll bring some as well. We'll get to, you know, them Possible sharing. Six, based, I got all of it for sure. Let's make love it happen. No worries. Well, look, enjoy the rest of your day and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Chris. See ya.